Welcome everyone to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. Of course, we're at the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research virtually. Um, we're very happy to have Ronald Raboy here with us today for this talk about um, Yinglish popular music. This is a part of our Yiddish Civilization lecture series, which is in conjunction with our Yiddish language summer program. And just for those that don't know about YIVO, I'll just take a moment to tell you a bit about YIVO. Uh, YIVO is a very special place for the contemplation and the study of Jewish history and Jewish culture. At the core of YIVO is an archive and a library with over 23 million uh, documents and over 400,000 books. Researchers and scholars come from around the world to use YIVO's materials in their work. Um, and in addition to making those materials available for everyone, we do a variety of initiatives like public programs, uh, educational initiatives, exhibitions, which bring this material to life for the broader public. So we're so happy to have you here with us to learn with us and to celebrate this wonderful culture. And we hope that you'll join us again. So if you are not already, make sure to sign up for our mailing list and follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, now, before I in introduce uh, Ron, David, is there anything you'd like to say perhaps about the summer program? David Brown is the academic director of the summer program. Well, I'd just like to say that the Zuma program has just finished its second week, which means that there are two thirds of it uh, that we um, will we have ahead of us. And one third of it that's kind of unbelievable is past us already. And it has a hundred and something students right now from a good over a dozen countries uh, and eight different classes. And it's really remarkable. And here we have a crowd of 220 people watching this live at the YIVO channel. Uh, and things are working out in an otherwise miserable time in the world. Things are working out in our little world quite remarkably, and we're very gratified. Uh, and welcome, Ron, and I will make myself scarce right now because I'm just here for moral support towards you. I love your work, and I can't wait to hear this talk. Thank you, David. So I'll just uh, give a brief introduction for Ron, and then I will hand it over. Uh, Ronald Raboy is a musician in independent scholar of Yiddish theater music. He was for many years a cellist in the opera and symphony orchestras of San Diego. His own music has been heard at both the Kitchen and MoMA in New York City. And in 1995, the San Diego Jewish Film Festival commissioned his score to Molly Pecan's Silent East and West. Active in the earliest years on the West Coast uh, Klezmer revival, Raboy's work with poet Jerome Rothenberg led to the creation of his experimental Big Jewish Band. As senior researcher for the Tomaszewski Project and working closely with Hanum Lotek of Blessed Memory at the YIVO archives, he developed the reconstructions of Yiddish theater scores that conductor Michael Tilson Thomas took to Carnegie Hall. Rob Boy has written for the Encyclopedia Judaica and Perspectives on New Music. Earlier this year, he taught in the YIVO Bard Winter Program and his study Abraham Elstein's film scores appeared in the Pauline Yearbook this spring. With Goldfaden scholar Elisa Quint, he is co-editing a critical edition of the opera Retta Shulamis from 1880 for Dusseldorf University Press, which is forthcoming. Ron, thank you so much for joining us, and we're really uh, excited to hear your talk today. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, it's very touching. I'm, ve I'm just so flattered to have been asked and very excited and uh, um, humbled by hundreds of people out there in the cyberspace. So welcome everybody. Uh, uh, and my screen just changed and it surprised me. <laughs> so I have never, I've never lectured to um, an inanimate object in front of me here before. So I'll, I'll try to, uh, to do a performance for you, but um, we'll see. So in 1951, in the in or just before the high holidays in 1951 in September, uh, two reviews opened on Broadway, um, and uh, they were uh, in two theaters, and, and they opened within ten days of each other. Both of them were Yinglish reviews. One of them was called Bagels and Yaks, Y O X, Yaks, like in which at that time meant, you know, funny, joking laughter. Um, it's, not a, it's not a phrase in English that's current, but it was then, I think. Um, the other show was uh, Borscht Capades. And, and both of them were reviews. Both of them were hybrid theater events. And uh, 
both of them uh, were predominantly in English, but had lots of Yiddish in them. And both of them were reviewed uh, in the New York Times, unfavorably, I, I should say, especially Bagels and Yaks. Bagels and Yaks, uh, uh, they're probably their most important uh, act in that show was, were the Barton brothers uh, and, and, and some, uh, some others uh, were in there. Um, uh, most, the one that comes to mind, who's most important to me is Ricky Lane and Velvel were, were in, in, in that show. Ricky Lane was a Yiddish ventriloquist and Velvel was his dummy. And Ricky Lane was, was a very skilled ventriloquist and a very skilled performer. His timing was excellent and he was, and, and Velvel, he, he handled Velvel beautifully. He became animated. He became almost, uh, uh, he truly became a character. Uh, what, what I knew him from as a child were, were from their appearances on the Ed Sullivan Show. And there is to my knowledge, exactly one clip, one uh, archived Ed Sullivan Show on YouTube with Ricky Lane and Velvel. And I strongly suggest you check it out. They were uh, really something. So apparently in the show, according to uh, Brooks Atkinson, the distinguished New York Times drama critic, who'd been in that seat for more than 20 years. Um, most of the show was conducted in English with just jokes, punchlines to jokes and that sort of thing uh, were in Yiddish often translated at the same moment. The only extended Yiddish event, and this is kind of wonderful, was Velvel lecturing the audience about how they should know how to, how to understand Yiddish better. So that's according to Brooks Atkinson's review. Um, he made Atkinson, who did not understand Yiddish, made one truly, uh, truly important observation. And he said, it may be that all the Yiddish are de uh, is devastatingly funny, but this department, that is his, he's speaking of himself in the third person, but this department cannot vouch for that. And even suspects that in Bagels and Yaks, all Yiddish words are regarded as funny, whatever they mean. And that truly represented a condition of Yiddish in the post-war years, in the 20th, in, you know, the second half of the 20th century. Um, uh, on Borscht Capades, he was, he, he, uh, was a, a little more enthusiastic because one of, the, one of the performers in that review was Phil Foster, who went on to become very well known in uh, many years later, uh, playing the role of what, what was his name? Frank DeFazio, I think on Laverne and Shirley, an important character actor. Uh, but he was, he was seen as the highlight of Borscht Capades. Mickey Katz, oh, well, here's what Atkinson said. Mickey Katz, leader of the band, is on the silly side as a mountebank. What does that mean? I have no idea what that means. I mean, I know what the word mountebank means in the dictionary, but I have no idea what that means as criticism. Also reviewing both of these reviews were distinguished Yiddish writers who were not amused. Uh, Maurice Schwartz of the Yiddish Art Theater uh, reviewed uh, the Borscht Capades in the Vorwärts. Now, Borscht Capades had been touring for over a year um, Oh, I just realized I have a swivel chair and I was doing it as I was talking. It must have been driving everyone crazy. I'll try to contain myself. Um, the uh, Schwartz was in Miami, in Miami Beach in, in the preceding February and he caught the Borscht Capades there. He, he wrote a long review in, in which he, he began by saying, there were two concerns that everyone had in Miami Beach. And of course, by everyone, he meant, he meant the Jewish community, which was very large at that time. Um, the two concerns were, will Truman use the atomic bomb on China? The Korean War had broken out the year before and China had launched a counterattack and pushed back the, the United Nations forces. And uh, there were there were those in Truman's military who were advocating for the use of the atomic bomb, of course. Anyway, that was one concern. And the other was, 
is it still possible to get tickets to the Borscht Capades? This was driving Schwartz nuts. He, his review is, he's so angry that they're sold out night after night after night. And he's trying to do, you know, uh, the brothers Ashkenazi and Yosha Kalb at, at the art theater and struggling to keep the, 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 the enterprise going. And this other thing is going, you know, blazes. The other thing that he observed was that Mickey Katz and his crew in, in the band were dressed like Hopalong Cassidy. They were dressed in Western outfits. And in fact, uh, I, I should, uh, oh, well, well, we'll get there in a minute. Um, I, I, I want to switch to media. And this is quite overwhelming uh, being a virtuoso keyboard artist here on my computer. Um, the, the, the Bagels and Yak show was reviewed by De, uh, David Einhorn, who was a distinguished poet. And he, would, he was also, uh, he had been active in the Bund, uh, in Vilna and, and elsewhere. And uh, he did not emigrate to the US until 1940. So he was a relative newcomer in America. He'd been here 10 years. He was the absolute wrong person to go there because he was going to hate it. I mean, nearly anyone, it would be easy for anyone to hate bagels and yaks, I suppose. Uh, I, I love the Barton brothers, but, it, but I could understand not liking it. Um, but Einhorn in particular was famous for having been a, la a language purist. And he was also, uh, his, his early groups of, his early poetry that he published making a premiere, he wrote sonnets for goodness sake, he wrote sonnets. He, he was a formalist and he believed in language purity. And there he was sent to this show that was, what was this show? Let, let's listen to a little bit of the Bartons brothers. Uh, and I have to remember how to do all this now. Um, so I'm going to share a screen with you. And there. So those, those are the Barton brothers, uh, Eddie and Murray, and uh, who, were, who were, I've read, not actually brothers, but there, there you have it. And he, here's an example of what they sounded like. <laughs> Herr Faberlock. Was willst du, Schmilsamel? Komm doch her zu dem Mikrofon. Ich bin schon da. Hör doch her, das ist eine neue Masse von mir. Ich habe eine Masse von einem Mädel, das heißt Minnie de Flapper. Minnie de Flapper? Und dann lass mich schon her, ein paar Werte. Ich will dir jetzt erzählen von Minnie de Flapper. Minnie ist gewähnt, am Euter Schlepper. Sie ist gegangen mit jedem Boy. So hat ihr nicht gehabt, sie ist ein Jetzt, sie ist ein Goi. There shall be a white Christmas. Okay, though that was a that selection was was good because it, it brought up several things. Uh, I mean, recurrent themes. Um, sex between Jews and Gentiles was a staple in the Barton Brothers acts. Um, schmutz in general, uh, they were um, they they used lots of double entendres and not even double entendres. You know, um, <laughs> uh, they uh, it was. It was a, a challenge for people like David Einhorn, who was outraged. And I, I uh, we'll look at what at what they wrote in a moment. Um, the um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm dealing with my technology here. I'm trying. Uh, 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 well, look, Einhorn wrote. Um, Einhorn wrote that. Uh, well, he misquoted uh, what the Barton brothers had actually had in their songs and um, uh, because he had not actually listened to them on records, but he had through hearsay, he understood what was supposed to be on their records and it outraged him. And he wrote uh, that, uh, that their, uh, uh, that, as you can see here, 
die Miese Theater Vorstellung auf Broadway und in der, und der jüdischen Eulen, was geht sie sehen. Grobe, vulgare Witzen bei rel religiöse Partys. So this is the ugly theater event, uh, performance on Broadway and the Jewish audiences that go to see them. Uh, dirty, vulgar jokes. Uh, and by religiöse parties, religious parties, by that he, what he, what he actually means is like at bar mitzvahs. And he likens the whole thing to those who go to bar mitzvahs and tell dirty jokes to each other. And he elaborates that in, in an essay. Uh, this is not really a review of the show because he never really talks about the show. It's just a, a polemic uh, in which he's outraged. He's just outraged by this. Uh, Schwartz, uh, Schwartz, on the other hand, was not outraged by the content exactly in the same way. He was more outraged that it drew bigger audiences than he got. Uh, and, and some of that was ego and some of it was concern for what that, what that meant for uh, uh, the state of the art. Um, uh, I, so I'm now trying to remember how to get back out of one screen and into another uh, and not doing it very well. Uh, so I would need to share with you. Uh, one of the other things that, um, that Einhorn, uh, oh no, that Brooks Atkinson wrote about and, and uh, that, that truly disturbed him um, was, was that, uh, Um, huh. Nothing is working on my computer as I was expecting it to. <laughs> so we'll, we'll just move on here. Um, he, he, he was very disturbed that they were all gathered around a microphone because to him that wasn't real theater. But as we heard, as you may have heard in that clip from the Barton brothers, it began with, let's, you know, come here to the microphone he says to his partner. And the microphone wasn't just a tool they were using, it was, a su it was the subject of their humor. Now, Mickey Katz, um, on the other hand, was, was much more theater. Uh, and I don't know why we have a blank screen here. Uh, okay, that was Mickey Katz. Let's listen to what he sounded like. And this is a picture of them in a Borscht, early Borscht Capades uh, incarnation uh, when they were on tour in the provinces. Uh, I've seen clippings. They took it to Milwaukee. They took it to St. Paul. They, uh, they, they had an extended season in Miami Beach. They played Los Angeles where Mickey Katz uh, was based. Um, so I don't know where this was. And, this version of his band is not a version, is not an instrumentation that we would necessarily hear uh, on any of the recordings, but this is what they look like. Katz is the clarinet player. Um, and what's notable is, is the Western getup that seemed very funny to them. Jewish cowboys seem to be an, an oxymoron and that seemed to be a, a source of endless humor. Um, and for those who know me, they know I've been really interested in that, that very, uh, uh, pro uh, that very issue, that, I mean, the, the very joke about the Jewish cowboy and why just saying it is funny and why it's even funnier to say Yiddish cowboy. But um, let's listen to what they sounded like because they're, the very first recording Mickey Katz made was a, you know, was a Western song. Whoa, I swear as you who slim open up them corral and let inside the kettle, Dalton. Take it easy with the chef salah. It's time already to put on the feeding bag. Hey, give me a hand. Me ta vai bela shein. Where the chefs and the tigalach laifen. Hey, give me a hoi. Mit gesinnte Cowboys und a couple hundert Kettel zu verkaufen. 
Hey, hey, my friend. Please drive in and bring plenty of change. They play me the joy care, a nice game of close boy care. He taught them in a high school off and range. No, honey child. It's a fog nigen to have deer with me off and range. We'll take a look on the Nissim from what else nature. <laughs> what else nature? Bamer, Blumen. So that photograph had uh, uh, was had um, not, not the photograph. I meant the recording had various tropes that were common to Mickey Katz's work then, uh, as he as he developed it through the 1950s. But one of the main features was that the high voice that he, I can't do it. I I, I don't uh, the high voice. That was a um, it was a shtick in Yiddish humor. S some of it may have gone back to early Hebe comics in vaudeville, uh, but some it was also common to, for example, Menasha Skolnick, who was uh, um, uh, uh, an important com comic actor in the 1930s and 40s and, and into the 50s, uh, and it was a there was a kind of emasculation to it um, that. But but cats would use it some of the time and then switch in and out of voices, and he was he was actually an extraordinarily good vocalist. He didn't have an operatic voice and he didn't have even a, a, a beautiful crooning voice, but he was a very skilled vocalist and he could use his vo his voice in in many ways. Um, So that, that was the terrain, but let, let's get back to uh, the Barton brothers. Um, and I still have to figure out, I keep getting lost here on how to uh, share my screen when I'm talking. Uh, find your system preferences. Okay. So the Barton brothers made their mark with something called Joe and Paul that sold, according to them, according to, uh, I can't remember which, I think it was Eddie, Mer Eddie Barton uh, speaking many years later. He claims that eventually 3 million copies were sold. I can't believe that. But of a, a parody of something called Joe and Paul. Now, Joe and Paul was an actual clothing store in uh, in New York City, and it had several locations, one on Pitkin Avenue in, uh, in Brownsville in Brooklyn, and one uh, in downtown Manhattan at uh, Stanton and Delancey. Um, and uh, it, it was a real clothing store and its owner named uh, Frank, I think, Kofsky, uh, commissioned composer Sholem Secunda to write a jingle for them. Sholem Secunda was a, a wonderful, Yiddish musician, uh, Yiddish theater musician. Uh, he was also, he, he wrote, he was a good composer. He wrote classical compositions. He wrote uh, um, uh, liturgical music and he wrote uh, numbers of w famous songs, including by Mir Bistushain. I mean, he was uh, a, a key Yiddish musician of that era. And Kofsky commissioned him to write this lyric, to write this jingle that he then sang himself on Yiddish radio. Joe and Paul, a store of far Greek, Bramarilla Joe and Paul, that let your bully creak, Bramarilla suit, a coat, a geet and zola perfect, I fed and daft here, Kuifen, Norba Joe and Paul. So that, oops, we shouldn't go to that yet. I just gave away the surprise. Um, that was the, uh, that was the original jingle and it, he, Kofsky paid to have it on the air constantly. And it was come into Joe and Paul, get a bargain. Uh, and there, there was, he, he probably changed the lyrics every time he sang it. Um, 
And according to uh, Henry Sapoznik, who many of you uh, know, is a, he was part an important figure in the Klezmer revival, important figure in Yiddish culture, um, uh, in general, um, founder of Klez Camp. He writes that uh, it was comedian Red Buttons who, who uh, wrote a routine uh, based on uh, Joe and Paul. Um, but the Barton brothers turned it into, expanded the routine and turned it into a, a, a real shtick that was quite remarkable. Uh, this is their, here is this original 78 that came out in like March or April of 1947. And uh, it was later collected um, on, uh, uh, on an on an LP, uh, along with some of their other um, some of their other uh, routines, it's possible that I can't see. Um, well, well, here it is. I think I think I have the complete thing here. The that that LP was then re released in the nineteen seventies. Uh, the the first one came out in fifty seven, I think. Uh, here is what Joe and Paul sounds like. Yeah, I send me sister. Yeah, bye. Every Sunday morning over WB. Sapagen Joe and Paul speak and a bargain king in our suit. A great a gabardine. Drink that on the clay and zinc. speech. I give for your morgen, I'm a liberal radio to hers. Every year's that program from John Paul's for some three stores. The race is located in Stendalency in downtown Manhattan. The street is located in Hunts Point, Southern Boulevard in the Bronx. In the dritte store located in Pitkin Avenue, Bronzeville, Brooklyn. Hot here by Mitzwingel over stuff from my slack suit. A two-ton, a reversible slicker, a herringbane, a jacket, a poison, a Miami Chevette, a Bronx Sharpie, a Brooklyn troop. Bring to my Einze. Joe and Paul's a bargain. Joe and Paul's making a bargain. Taking a suit, a coat, a gabardine. God speech. Mames, hot here, I in your boy in the hem. Are you Felton, 15 year old? Was Gerton to say in a boy, let's show. A coach in French, postal cards. A kim to him, get around in the bathroom. Macht see the tear, macht in the Mames, tit me right, toy, and get them boy up, put two there. In shik the marine, say kakai, Jenny. In a time of wasting his feet, this is. Is fake tire man, I can't in this plot, say it get. Whoops, I am sorry. I did not mean to stop right there. Um, but that's a, that's a good place. We'll, we'll stop right there. Um, I shouldn't have had you on that screen all that time because I'm, I was going to try to explain how the song goes. Let's do a close reading of how this goes. Okay, so it's. All right, the first part. That's the intro. But there's several things that could be said about one. It's in, uh, it's in a Jewish mode. It's in the Meshebeirech mode or scale. And that's, a, that's a, a marker to tell you where we are, whose territory we're in, that this is going to be an ethnic record. 
Now this record was not released on, an, on a Jewish label. Banner Records was releasing dozens of novelty songs, Yiddish novelty songs, comedy songs, Molly Pika and Menashe Skolnick and many others. Uh, and, but the Barton brothers were on Apollo who were primarily a jazz and gospel label. Um, and it wasn't necessary to have this, this opening, but this opening is also serving another function. It's, a, it's an overture. It only lasts eight measures or so, but it's an overture. And then Okay, now the show has begun. And that vamp, that's called a vamp, where it's just marking time. That's a frame. That's a frame that tells us now we're gonna have a story inside this event. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. All right, that's, that's like pseudo Hasidic, right? Like ba 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 ba, except it's boy, oh boy, oh boy, which is uh, kind of, oh, how could this be happening to me? Uh, Jewish pain, Jewish angst, right? Um, but the pain is, uh, then comes to finally a half cadence. Your boy, your boy, your boy, your boy, your boy, your boy, W B V D. All right, what's W B V D? Well, it's call letters, supposedly. Obviously, it's, it's because we now know that the story is set in a radio station. We didn't know that until this moment. Uh, now, it's not really call letters. There really was W E V D, which was an actual Yiddish radio station. Those call letters, incidentally, E B D. Oh, stood for Eugene V. Debs, the uh, four-time, three, four-time candidate for president of the United States on uh, um, the socialist ticket. In 1912 election, he won nearly a million votes, uh, a great hero to, to many. And the station was actually founded in the 1920s by the Socialist Party of America. But in 1932, at the, at the nadir of the depression, uh, the Forwards Association, which published the Daily Forwards newspaper, bought uh, WEVD and it became a Yiddish radio station. So they're making fun of that. Now, WBVD, BVDs were what? They were underwear. They were a union suit. The, it was the BVD, I can't remember the name, Voorhees and Day, I can't remember who W was. Uh, in the 1870s, they started marketing a one piece underwear that included bottoms and tops and a back flap for uh, relieving oneself. Um, and, and BVDs became, like Kleenex became the name, became a word for facial tissue. BVDs became a word for underwear. So they're making a kind of slightly silly juvenile joke from WEVD to WBVD. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. W B V D. Hey bop a re bop. What's that? Hey bop a re bop. Well, it's hipster jive. Um, I'm afraid I have to now try to get back in and uh, oh, I, I want to share a screen, but I can never remember how to do this. Um, share screen. Hey Bapa Rebop was actually a song by uh, Lionel Hampton band recorded it um, in at the end of like in 1939. Um, and it, it sounded like this. Oh, destroyed by technology. Matilda Brown told old King Tut, say if you can't say Rebop, keep your big mouth shut. Hey Bapa Rebop. Hey Bapa Okay, so they, the Barton brothers sing, instead of hey, bop, a re, bop, hey, they sing hey, bop, a re, bop, re, bop, a major third. Now, in, in, the, in, in the, the, the song, hey, bop, a re, bop, was uh, influenced by the blues, because it has a kind of blues progression near the beginning. So it's da, da, ba, dee, ba, 
da, da, there's the major third. Hey, bop, a re, bop, ha, da. Hey, bop, a re, bop, ha, ha. That's uh, that's actually the flat seven of the subdominant chord, but that's which which would be the the sub the the four chord would be you know the subdominant chord in a blues progression for those who know music. Uh, so there's that dialectic between the major the ma uh, the major third and and the sound of the minor third. Uh, that dialectic is the blues, and it's expressed as a blue note, which is neither major or minor. When the Barton Brothers sing it they ratchet it up to the major third and just leave it that way. And it is for, for lack of a better word, it's very white. That's what it is. Uh, hey, hey, bop, a re, bop. And they're contrasting that with, uh, with what had come just before, um, it, which was WBVD. Um, and uh, oh, you know what? I, I have to go back and share something with you because I left out very important information uh, there. Um, yeah, because the the pseudo Hasidic, uh, the pseudo Hasidic babas were actually uh, a song uh, in meine Eugen bist du schön, in my eyes you're beautiful that was uh, by Joseph Rumshinsky. And uh, it was introduced by Molly Pekin and uh, um, uh, who it even tells on this, uh, Leon Gold in, in a show in 1931 on Second Avenue. It was the last, it was, the show was Ganevische Liebe, uh, uh, translated here as The Love Thief. Um, it was the last show uh, in a, that, in which Molly Pekin collaborated with Rumshinsky. Uh, after a run that had begun in before 1925, where they had one smash hit after another. Uh, uh, I can't remember how many shows, but many, several every season uh, for all those years. But then the depression came and this was their last show together. Uh, uh, they resumed collaborating later in the, in the 1940s. Um, but um, here's, here's what it sounds like. This is uh, this is from a, a, an appearance that Molly Pekin did in the 1960s with Joey Adams uh, for some kind of benefit. Okay, boy, 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 oh boy, oh boy, W B B D. So it's the same song, but the Barton Brothers take an up-tempo song and turn it into he, boy, 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 boy. Now notice the words are by Nachum Stuchkov, and and here it says and Molly Pekin. Most generally speaking, in in all the other. Uh, Everywhere else you read about this show, and you see that Stuchkov wrote all the lyrics. But apparently, Molly Pekin got uh, took a credit on this. I'm not I'm not dismissing her as a lyricist. In fact, she was a brilliant lyricist. Uh, but she she usually did not share credit with anyone. She wrote dozens of songs, uh, but usually did not sh uh, does lyrics to dozens of songs, but uh, usually didn't share credit. Now Stuchkov was in fact. Uh, like something like the dramatic director on WEVD, and he wrote uh, num he wrote uh, he wrote play radio plays that were produced there, and he was also a lexicographer. He wrote a, a brilliant thesaurus, a Yiddish thesaurus. He was a, an incredible uh, individual. Uh, but the fact that he had a close relationship to WEVD uh, makes me think that the Barton brothers were also particularly needling him by using that song and calling it WBVD, but I, I don't know that. I just like to think that. Um, so uh, th that's, what the, that's what the song uh, is like when it's not doing the jingle. Then they sing the jingle straight, which is pretty good. Joe and Paul's a fargain, da 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 da. Joe and Paul's making a bargain, Craig and Nasuta, Cota Gabardine, bring the Rhine and claim him in. 
Joe and Paul, you can get a bargain there, a uh, suit of coat or a gabardine, bring in your little son, um, uh, presumably for his bar mitzvah suit. So that, that, that was the jingle. Then they start, then they do, uh, the, they start reading stage directions to themselves. They stop singing and say, cut, speech. Now that's something that would appear in a script, but it's not something that should be read but they're showing what's going on on the inside in the radio and they start doing a commercial and they, they do a pitch for Joe and Paul. And then they totally go off the rails and they start saying, mamas, does your boy, your boy who's maybe 15 years old come home from a burlesque show and he's got French postal cards and he goes into the bathroom and locks the door, oy, 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 oy. mamas, do yourself a favor. Give your boy a couple dollars and send him to Cockeye Jenny. If you don't know where she is, ask your husband. He knows very well. So, I mean, this is, this is, this is outrageous. I mean, it's just, it's smut, right? <laughs> and it was totally off the rails and it made no sense in terms of what had come before. But it was, uh, but it was so anarchic and so uh, antic that, uh, that people, saw, not David Einhorn, but many people loved this kind of stuff. It was very funny. And it had those ubiquitous themes of uh, uh, sex with Gentiles and teenage masturbation and uh, all the stuff that uh, uh, authors like Philip Roth would later explore um, using a different tone. So um, that, was, th that was what the Barton brothers were about. And I'm of course way behind. So I'm going to now move uh, to Mickey Katz and uh, this will involve screen sharing so that I know where I am again. Um, and here we are. This is here, I've done this. Uh, and I was gonna play you another song, but, uh, but I couldn't, didn't have time. So uh, Spike, uh, I mean, a, a Barton Brothers songs. Spike Jones, uh, uh, Spike Jones. Mickey Katz was from Cleveland, and he, uh, he was a successful band leader there, uh, but he got hired in 1946 to, by Spike Jones and his City Slickers, who did uh, funny stuff. Uh, and this was, uh, and he started touring with him. So this was a big break for Mickey, uh, Mickey Katz. Um, and he was hired principally because he uh, had these vocal skills, although he was also a good conductor and arranger and would often be an assistant. He would take over for Spike apparently uh, when Spike was uh, busy or uh, otherwise occupied on stage. Uh, but this is a, 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 a quick clip from, from the Jones Polka where Mickey Katz actually even got a credit. Uh, and he's the vocalist on this. <laughs> So he was, he did that. Uh, then this is Spike Jones uh, was in this film, Variety Girl, which had three dozen stars. Uh, and you can see Spike Jones is down here. He's the absolute bottom and it doesn't show here because I see that I didn't allow for this big band of, uh, uh, oh, it does show on my computer, it didn't, but I'm looking at a monitor. So here it is, Spike Jones is, is listed at, at the end here. And we'll show you what, what uh, Mickey Katz, who was getting unhappy with uh, his pay, he wasn't being paid much. And this is what he was, uh, this is what the work looked like with uh, Spike Jones. In the car oh, 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 oh. of the thrush on a blossoming bough. So that was Mickey Katz uh, uh, in a film. Um, and uh, I cut it short because I'm, I'm 
taking too long here. Um, but he he left uh, Spike Jones not that long thereafter uh, when he was in a he was in a recording session uh, with Spike Jones group uh, that include but and the session I believe included a trumpeter Manny Klein who uh, was from New York but was uh, uh, like Spike Jones was on the West Coast and where Mickey Katz had uh, relocated to uh, and they were in recording sessions I and, uh, Manny Klein I played a, a lot of film dates. I think he was in the MGM orchestra, I can't remember. Um, and between takes for something, and they were in an RCA studio, um, uh, Kat started uh, fooling around with Manny and he started singing uh, his Came Off the Range, Home on the Range. And un he was unaware that the mic was still hot and in the control room was an RCA executive who thought he was terrific. And so he, uh, Long story short, it turned into a uh, recording contract with RCA and Mickey Katz left Spike Jones. Um, I'm going to go back to sharing screen. So uh, Katz uh, stayed with Victor and did a, a bunch of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, more than a dozen recordings from 19, uh, starting in December of 1947. But by the end of 1949, he uh, decided to move over to um, uh, Capitol. And, uh, and at Capitol, they, they started also issuing these singles, but, uh, but also re-recorded some of uh, the ones that he had recorded for RCA. So, for example, remind you that this is the RCA came off and rain. Whoa, Schweres! You who slim have moved them corral and laws around the cattle dotten. Take him easy with the ships, Allah. This is bald side to put on the feeding bag. So that's that's the. Uh, whoops! I don't know if I can get to my. Uh, I can't seem to turn this on because I have. You don't see what I see, but uh, uh, on my uh, Zoom screen here, I have information that's covering uh, what's doing. So I have to get out of stop, I have to stop sharing, and now I can play it for you. So this is the this is the capital version. Ron, we can't hear oh. it if um, if you don't share the screen. Oh, thank you. Yes, I can't share it. So I. We'll have to quickly get out of here and move it and rearrange this and save it. I'm doing computer work here. Uh, and now I'm gonna share screen. Um, sorry, folks. This is what happens in the new reality of trying to lecture. So. Here is That's inside the kettle, Dalton. Take it easy with the chef Salah. All right, that's the capital recording. Now, uh, um, I want you to notice that the RCA Victor recording was a Jewish recording. You see where it says Jewish here? Can you see my cursor? Whereas they don't put that on the capital. He's no longer, and the capital wasn't releasing Jewish recordings. RCA Victor had been in the business along with race records, that is to say R&B and earlier blues records uh, and, and various other international records as they called it. They, they, they uh, marketed Jewish records. Capital wasn't in that business. The other thing that Capital did was add reverb. Let's listen again. Now here's the Capital version inside the kettle, Dalton. Take it easy with the chef, Salah. Now, some of that was an aesthetic decision. Some of that was just technology. Uh, that's what was happening right in those years was that uh, reverb was being discovered and different ways of doing it. Uh, um, but the point being that it was moving from a race record to a pop, cro to a pop crossover. And this was really important for, um, for Mickey Katz's career. Um, let me show, play some another brief uh, 
clip here of Herr Mendel's Kocheling. I know a dark, secluded joint right near a place called Patchke Point. They serve you wine in two cents plain. It's called Herr Mendel's Kocheling. Oy vey. Okay, so that that was that, that was just one of many. It was a takeoff on Hernando's Hideaway, which was from the, the show Pajama Game, uh, and it had been a hit. Um, notice the castanet solo by Xavier Epstein. That's obviously a joke. But this also, but this kind of song, this is a template for what Mickey Katz mostly did, because then he went into uh, this kind of uh, instrumental. Break they the saw you Bosch cocktails on the hour And when it rains, it's a salt shell shower It smells from herring or not from flowers Down at Heimendel's Kuchelein Oy vey All right, the important thing there is that <laughs> Mickey Katz had a terrific band and they all mostly always would do a little klezmer interlude in the middle. Yeah, this was before the klezmer revival and people didn't say klezmer. Well, people did because on one record, uh, uh, Katz actually introduces Manny Klein as klezmer Manny Klein, which was a joke then uh, at that time to use the word that way. Um, but uh, th this was a small group of studio players uh, who were all virtuosi and they were playing really a kind of chamber music. Um, one of the great songs that they did was based on um, uh, Frankie Lane's Cry of the Wild Goose, which again, I am not able to get to my uh, the, to my uh, control to be able to play it. So I'm just gonna move on and we'll listen to Mickey Katz's version of Geschrei uh, von der Wilder Katschke. Uh, this uh, this um, uh, translate, transcription and translation of the lyrics were, was from the Klezmer Conservatory Band's uh, A Jumpin' Night at the Garden of Eden, a 1988 release uh, uh, on an album. And the, um, the translators that I really must give credit to um, were uh, Sylvia Fuchs Fried, uh, Hankus Netsky, David E. Fishman, and Judy Bressler. Um, uh, they didn't, they were the collective translators for the whole album. Um, let's listen to this because there's some wonderful things. <laughs> Yesterday I went to the butcher shop to buy a chicken and a couple of chops. The butcher said that we got catch gear today. The catch gear, hoy, the men and gay baggish. I want to go where the wild goose goes, cause I know more than a wild goose knows. My cop, she quits to my pee picture trick. It won't be long, I'll be up, get flicked. So we're not going to have time for the whole thing, but I want to play a different a part later in the song and talk about it a bit. Uh, it's it's uh, let me let me fly let me fly let me fly a vec. Let me fly. Let me fly. My heart knows what oh. the wild goose knows, oh, and I must Frankie go Lane. where the wild goose goes. Wild goose, brother goose, which is best? A wandering foot or heart at rest? Let me fly, let me fly, let me fly away. Spring is coming, and the ice will break. So what you heard in the Frankie Lane original recording was that to imitate the goose, they had these 
uh, various brass calls, some of which were in polytonal relation. They weren't in the same key as, as, the, uh, as the song. Uh, what Mickey Katz did was turn that into a sound that, that integrated Jewish culture by evoking a shofar in some of the songs, in some of the calls of these brass and, and double reeds that were, that were squawking uh, in the song. Uh, the way he, the way Mickey Katz imitated that fly away, fly away was wonderful. <laughs> Oh, you see, for fallen, it ain't no use. The butcher, if I gave me a rhyme, I could do. Right before that. Bada goes, Rapa Holachki, Balda gonna lay via Tate Kachki. Let me fly, let me fly, let me fly a big. Let me fly, let me fly, Okay, this is another example of uh, Mickey Katz incorporating the Yiddish culture into the, in more subtle ways than just dropping Yiddish vocabulary. Where he, he said, fly a vec, fly a vec, fly a vec, or fly away, fly away, uh, whatever he said, fly a vec. And then he, and then he made that animal sound, uh, back, back, back. And then the band came in, ya da 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 that is a dance that's a, it's a, it's a completely well-known tune, and it's a share, which is a dance, which a share is a scissors dance. Share actually means shear or scissors. And it's called a scissors dance because the, it's like a contra dance where the, where the, the, the dancers uh, cross each other. Um, and that's subject to some arguments about what, the, but it doesn't matter because that's what people thought it meant. And Mickey Katz, was dropping in the the reference. Now, this is like a cartoon. This this duck who thought he's going to be slaughtered by the shoichet isn't really going to be slaughtered. It's like a cartoon. It's like Daffy Duck. It's like Wiley e. Coyote, I should say, or or Sylvester Cat. Terrible, catastrophic things happen to them. But but we know that they're they're not dead. They die, but they're not dead. And this duck's not going to die. It's going to you know this terrible thing's going to happen. He's not going to really be killed and eaten. But then when the scissors come, what's going to, what, that's scary. And we hear him squawk. And what can you trim? That to me, I think, I have to say that I think that there, there's a suggestion of castration there, amplified by that classic emasculated voice. And the duck squawks when the sound of the scissors happens. So all of this stuff gets packed into these songs. Uh, that are, it's filled with with endless references and very very funny lyric writing. He was an, uh, and very very skilled uh, um, performance. Now I left out something else that I absolutely have to go back to because it um, oh and I have to share screen to do it and I can't remember how to do that as I'm talking. Share screen. Um, so, remember how this begins. Take him easy with the ship, Salah. This is both sides to put on the feeding bag. Okay, you, so it's. <laughs> Whoa, Achashveris. Uh, then he says, open up the cattle. Open up the corral over there. Uh, it's it's feeding time. Uh, don't forget to take care of the little sheep. That's that's what he's saying there. But um, the the important thing is that it opens with that incredible uh, phrase. Whoa, Achashveres. Now, what's who's Achashveres besides a not not a Jewish? He's not a he's a he's a horse. And it's not a Jewish name, but it's a name from Jewish tradition. Ahasuerus was the king of Persia in the Purim story, the book of Esther, which begins, the Megillah begins. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. Uh, and 
Mickey Katz came from a Froome family, from a very religious, very traditional family. He knew this stuff and, and he knew what it meant to refer to Achash Beiros. Um, and the book of Esther, the Megillah, is what's read at Purim. And, and that reading of the book of Esther is the, the ur source for Yiddish theater. It's the first kind of Yiddish theater that happened was reading the book of Esther uh, and, and rabbis gave leave to horse around, uh, ha, that's appropriate, um, and uh, to drink, to wear costumes when you're doing it, to exaggerate, to satirize it. And the Purim spiel became the first kind of Yiddish theater and the, it, it, the progenitor of Yiddish theater. And Mickey Katz, who's dressed also, remember that they also dressed in costumes. They dressed like, like Hopalong Cassidy, as Maurice Schwartz said. Um, uh, they were dressed up and fooling around, wearing costumes, and starting out by, with this evocation of a hush wearers. Um, that to me is significant. And uh, having just thought of it, I included it here, but it needs uh, to be um, um, explored some more. Now, I know that we're coming to the end of, of this lecture and uh, let's just look at a couple of uh, Mickey Katz albums here. Um, uh, this album, yeah, you can see it, most Meshiga Katz. And, I had suggested I'd be talking about Alan Sherman. I don't think that there's time. Um, we won't, people know a lot of Alan Sherman songs. The most famous one was uh, Hello Mother, Hello Father. Uh, I actually escaped that. I was into the first two albums, but I outgrew Alan Sherman by the time of Hello Mother, Hello Father. Although all of that happened in the space of 18 months. His first three albums all happened in a year and a half. And then, uh, and then his career started uh, taking a nosedive. Um, what uh, Mickey Katz in his autobiography explains that after he was horsing around with Manny Klein and they were singing Haymoth and Range, uh, he, he acknowledges that the Barton brothers had had this huge success with Joe and Paul and that it was in the air. Alan Sherman never suggests anywhere in print that he owed a debt to Mickey Katz, although he clearly did, um, because both of them were taking well-known songs and rewriting, so, uh, rewriting lyrics that had uh, heavy Jewish content. Alan Sherman's was, the Jewishness was of the released songs was more subtle uh, and it had to do sometimes with grammatic inflections with some exact references, but almost never with Yiddish. Um, However, you should know that earlier in his career in the 1950s, which is to say right when Mickey Katz was really hitting the airwaves, uh, uh, Alan Sherman did write Yiddish uh, takeoffs on, on uh, hit parade songs. Listen to this. Uh, it, it, well, this was recorded at a party in the 1960s, but he had written it 10 years earlier. And this is the song, You're the Top by Cole Porter. Oh, I lost it. I'm going the wrong way on a one-way street. There it is. A golden a moment <laughs> when Cole Porter arrived. <laughs> it's gotta be slow, I'm sorry. It goes like this. And a guy explains, I'll write a verse and it'll say like, uh, I wish I could express to you whatever I could, but if I could express to you, that's what I would. Like this. You're the top. You're a dozen dollars. You're the top. You're Chaim Weitzman's talent. You're the fins in back of a Cadillac that's new. You're a house by Levitz, a man of Shevitz, a font in blue. You're the gas in a 
a seltzer fizzer. You're the class. You're the Moyle's new scissor. I'm a poor Schlemiel who would like to steal a hop. So if baby, I'm a Schmendrick, you're the top. I got another chorus. Okay, uh, I'm guessing uh, we probably don't have time for much more Alan Sherman. Um, uh, so, uh, you know what, I'm going to go back to screen share and take it out to show you uh, um, uh, more evidence besides what we hear to suggest that he was uh, influenced by Mickey Katz. Um, these are these were his first two albums, My Son the Folk Singer and My Son the Celebrity. Uh, and, and we could talk forever about the iconography here. Um, uh, there, uh, well, we won't still. <laughs> we'll just move on. And I want to point out uh, that My Son the Folk Singer album is a kind of amalgamation of these two Mickey Cats. Um, album covers. I, In my bones, I'm sure that Alan Sherman was um, influenced by that. Um, they look, they have, they have elements of each other. The, the pedestals uh, in, in this one with the pedestal here, the, you know, the untouchable aloof model, the, the, the guitar pose, um, and uh, I'm sure there's more, but uh, I mean, the salamis, the food, uh, there's just, there are too many common features. And, uh, and it, it seems impossible to me that Alan Sherman was not, had not studied those albums very carefully. So I think that's all I, we have time for. Um, but I, I guess I would ask our moderators if that's true, are we out of time? I think maybe now's a good time to go over to questions. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, that's Ron, fine with thank, me. Yes, thank you yes. so much for this wonderful talk. This was fantastic. I wish we had time to listen to the full discography. <laughs> um, we've yeah. got a lot of questions here, so maybe we'll yeah. just dive into that. Okay, okay fine. Yeah. Um, here's a, a softball question to start with. Do you know what uh, the Barton brothers' real names were? I don't. Okay. Uh, uh, their, 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 their real names are Eddie and Murray. Okay. Uh, yeah. And they're not really brothers. I've read some, some sources allege that. I have never read anything. I've never read either of them being quoted saying they're not. Okay. So I don't know. Um, someone asks, how does Benny Bell fit into this picture? Well, there are lots and lots of people doing these satirical songs of the various kinds of satirical songs. Uh, no one had a lock on it. Um, the, the Barton brothers were in some ways the most successful because of that, because their rise was so meteoric and they were the first to begin to cross over. And Apollo Records was a Jewish owned label, but it wasn't a Jewish music label. Uh, so, so that was also striking. Whereas Benny Bell, you know, was strictly within the community. You know, um, could you let us know the name of that film clip that you played? Some people would like to check it out. Oh, the film was called Variety Girl, and it was uh, Paramount Film. Um, I bought a commercial DVD of it. So mm. there was at one point there was one available, and there's. If, if it's still not available new, there's probably used copies out there. There's, and, and, and you can find occasionally on YouTube, you can find it. Okay. Um, and how about that, that Alan Sherman, You're the Top, which was really wild. <laughs> oh, that is on, that is now available on a new, on a CD that's been released. Um, and I'm not sure, let me think where I've set it down. Um, because I can't remember the title of the CD off the top of my head. Is that on uh, your bibliography by any chance? No, because I only just found out about it and I was hesitant to, to change it. Uh, uh, okay, well, for just, just while you're thinking about that for a second, I'll say 
uh, reiterate, and I just sent it again in the chat, that uh, Ron prepared a wonderful bibliography, which includes a discography. Um, so a lot of the stuff you can you can find you where to find it in this uh, PDF, which is on Yibo's website. I just sent the link for that. Um, you can find that you're the top and other songs that were on it. Um, uh, on YouTube, um, the the person who put it together was Alan Sherman's biographer, Mark Cohen, who has written a scholarly monograph on call, called Overweight Sensation, Brandeis University Press. Um, and he put together that CD and he's, a, you can find him on YouTube. Oh, and the album I believe is named after Sherman's parody of, oh, what have we, what have we got? We ain't got dames. What have we got? We ain't got locks. I think that's the title of the of the CD, mm. and it was released in 2014. And it has these early uh, parodies. There's another great one. Uh, when I walk through the Bronx, uh, on the Fordham Road, you know, it's it's very funny. So, and and actually, that's an important part of what Sherman's art was about was to find. Um, I'd say even impassioned songs or songs that are heavily invested with motion and then and then overlay them with exceedingly mundane lyrics of really quotidian so, uh, situations and and it's the uh, it's the tension between the two that so often drives the humor hmm. um, we've got someone asked a question here the emasculated Jewish male is still a popular character in many comedy TV shows today um, why do you think that trope uh, appealed and still appeals to audiences and specifically to a Jewish audience? Whoa, big topic. Um, I don't, uh, I don't even know where to start answering that. Um, there, there are those who have suggested that it's a, that it's, uh, a vestigial effect of, of self-hatred. Um, there are um, there are those who would say that Jewish that um, feigning impotence and feigning emasculation um, is a way of negotiating with the Gentile world by by uh, painting yourself as as not a threat. And, 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 and then you can, through other means, get what you need. So there, there are all sorts of explanations and there are all sorts of, uh, I mean, it's such a huge field. Um, and, and a bunch of names are not coming to me as we speak. Um, but um, um, yeah. there's a lot of, there's a tons of questions here. We won't have time to get to everything sadly, but uh, if I can kind of combine two different questions, um, why do you think that this music resonated so much with the Jewish community? Um, and especially despite its vulgarity uh, or maybe because of its vulgarity in relationship to, you know, kind of uh, more mainstream Jewish attitudes about those topics? Well, some of it was nostalgia for the fading J Yiddish culture. World War II had erased or if not Yiddish culture, it had erased it had erased the possibility of Yiddish being the dominant Yiddish civilization, uh, the the dominant Jewish civilization of Yiddish being that, um, and uh, as Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet once pointed out to me, the last words that. Uh, that survive uh, as, a, as a language is fading are those from the kitchen and those from the bathroom. Um, and, and, and it's partly because these are the earliest, the earliest uh, words that, that children learn. And so what you learn as a child sticks around. Uh, and there are probably other reasons why, and I, I'm not a sociolinguist, um, but Mickey Katz, is, the, Mickey Katz has entire songs that are just food that it's nothing else but food. Uh, there was a song uh, in the late 40s, uh, a guy named Lee Tully recorded it, and then it was re-recorded by Billy Hodas in 1950 called Essen, uh, which is also just a, rest a patter song of food, but a manic patter song of food. Um, 
So that happened, but mostly I would suggest that it's about um, um, trying to hold on to what was remembered. And if, do you think that that accounts for our interest today as well? Because if, if it was nostalgia and if it was the disappearance of, of this culture at that time, are we hanging on to it for a similar reason? Uh, people younger than me didn't grow up with it. So it's not, it's, it's not, it's not what they knew from their childhood necessarily. Um, and I'm not in a position to, to answer that. I, part of what we're responding to today is that it is really good work. These were really fine artists. They were very skilled at what they did. The Barton brothers were really good at what they did. Their timing was immaculate. You know, um, Mickey Katz was a terrific band leader. I mean, those are knockout performances. They nail everything. Um, he was a good um, clarinetist. He was a fabulous singer um, and, he, and he was a good writer. Um, I should credit, I mean, uh, many of the arrangements in his band were done actually by his, by his collaborator, Nat Farber, who was a, a, a studio pianist. Um, and, but everyone was in the studio. So that's, that was the cauldron that, that, you know, where all this stuff came from. All right, maybe that's a good place for us to end. Ron, thank you so much for this fantastic talk. Um, Hopefully we'll have another chance to listen with you again soon. Oh, you're very welcome. And thank you so much for asking. I really appreciated it. And thank you everyone who is out there listening. Thank you everyone.